We have an interesting subject this morning, and I realize that for a great many folks, this is a sensitive area. But I think in fairness to all concern, we must face into some of the phenomena of our times. You will probably remember, some of you at least, that following World War I, there was a tremendous emphasis upon spiritualism. A number of very brilliant leaders of public thought, men of the caliber of Sir Oliver Lodge, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Professor Hislop, became concerned with survival, the continuance of consciousness after death. Obviously, the cause of this tremendous emphasis was the tragedy of the war itself. Millions of young people died in that war. Their parents, their friends, even their children became deeply involved in the hope of the survival of consciousness. This resulted in extensive research in psychic phenomena and to a measure at least this research is continuing to the present time. But at the moment, the situation seems to be somewhat different. The average person in this country, at least, has not had the experience of the parents of World War I in Europe. They have a different point of view. And modern psychology, psychic phenomena, appear to be focused in a different direction. And uh, in the last year or two particularly, I have been almost inundated <coughs> with requests to explain psychic occurrences in the lives of people. I get letters from all over this country and Europe. And people constantly want to know what some psychic experience they have had means. Sometimes they tell me the experience. Sometimes they think I ought to know it already. <laughs> but after having read the description, if they uh, have one, we are all more or less nonplussed. There seems to be no general, natural, significant, practical way of explaining a great part of this outburst of psychic pressure that is in the atmosphere at the present moment. You pick up some journals and publications and you think of Egypt and you remember the thousands of little charms and talismans and figures that were worn around the necks of the Egyptians and buried with them. In the paper we find that today similar charms and talismans and amulets are being offered seriously on the grounds that they have psychic influence. So over a period of 4,000 years the same phenomena continues. This is uh, something we have to give a little thought to. I've looked around and I'm not interested in exposing or downgrading the psychic seeking of the human being. Far from it. I feel quite convinced that there are some perfectly honorable and perfectly practical and reliable consequences in some cases. But the true mystical, mystical experience is comparatively rare. And much of the material that comes in almost every day for consideration simply cannot represent a valid approach to the problems involved. I think one of the most interesting problems that we have to consider is the source of this tremendous torrent of psychism uh, that is now moving in on us. And uh, looking around, it seems to me that perhaps Buddhist philosophy comes the nearest of any philosophical structure that could have a bearing on the subject. 
Buddha was the one who first psychologically emphasized the importance that that which comes out of the individual in most cases is something that went into him from his material environment. In other words, the human being receives through the sensory perception certain impressions. These impressions coordinated by the mental unifier. After a time, these impressions interpreted, digested, and unified come out again through the individual and he attributes them to some source within himself. Let us see if we can make this point a little clearer. Wherever we have social insecurity, we have pressure upon the psychic life. When things run easily and comparatively smoothly and the individual is relatively secure, his mind does not run to this type of thinking. But when he is variously bewildered, when he does not know what to do next, when he does not know how to evaluate the conditions of his own life, he then rushes to someone else for help. Now, psychology, from a scholastic standpoint, has had much to do with trying to rationalize the problems of society. But there are other problems which psychology cannot handle because of its limited perspective. These are problems of the individual's personal interior life, where he is on uh, certain as to his own conduct, where he is confused, this confusion becomes part of his subconscious. This remains very much like Pandora's box with the lid down until the individual does something to lift the lid. One of the things he may do to try to lift the lid is to practice some kind of meditational disciplines. He may try to unfold his own consciousness in an effort to reach into himself for greater security. Now how he is going to do this is again a problem. I suppose that there are fifty or a hundred different recommended ways to unfold inner consciousness. Most of these ways differ in one respect or another. The individual reaching out for some way of cultivating his inner faculties is very likely to practice some type of metaphysical discipline, concentration, meditation. He is apt to try almost any type of method of concentrating attention upon the unfoldment of internal factors. This, in many instances, arises in persons that are not at all equipped to handle this type of situation. They firmly believe, in fact, in some cases, they are taught to believe that all they have to do is to practice some meditational discipline and the inner life will move out through them. Or, perhaps, under certain conditions, through these types of disciplines, they will be brought into contact with superior beings, hierarchies or orders of life, which will enable them uh, to get the solutions they seek to the problems they face. Now this situation has resulted in a series of very strange circumstances, which I think are probably best approached through the Buddhistic philosophy. We have to have some kind of a framework for this. We have to rationalize it or organize it before we can examine it. If we wish to assume that the individual over the course of years has become involved in a load of psychic pressures within himself, if we realize that all kinds of things that ex happen to him on the material plane of life have left scar tissue, have built various pressures into his subconscious personality. There is the person who 
arose in a divided home who never had proper parental re relationships. There is another who came from a bigoted or irresponsible family and had no proper encouragement for the development of normal faculties. We have individuals who had bad marriages and were unable to cope with the family responsibility problems. Also, we have some graduates from the drug culture. We have individuals that 10 or 12 years ago were tied into the drug subculture. Many of them have worked out of it and are no longer involved in it. But the record of it, the pressures of it, the consequences of it are still in themselves. We also find others who are financially insecure. Jobs are hard to keep. The individual has, had not, has not had sufficient training to feel secure in his employment. He may have extravagant tastes which he is unable to gratify. He may be picked up in the inflation. Or he may be trying to buy a home and cannot get the necessary loans to take care of the deal. He may also have health problems. Many people are finding tremendous nervous ailments developing from tension, stress, frustration, and self-pity. All of these pressures retire into the individual. And under normal conditions, perhaps they will remain there for his entire lifetime. If he is a materialist, and has no belief in any mystical or metaphysical factors in daily living, then he will simply ignore this and go on being sorry for himself, but rationalize it in terms of his external circumstances. If, however, he is more religiously inclined, if he is looking for some inner understanding of the phenomenon that he is faced by, then he begins to attempt to develop some form of internal spiritual security. He takes the attitude that he must, from within himself, uh, release values which will take care of him. He is taught this. Many groups are advertising it. Many individuals are working with each other in these problems. The idea being to break through the outer crust of fear and anxiety and find a quiet, serene inner life behind the problems of daily existence. But here is where the Buddhist philosophy steps in. It points out that when you open the door between the objective and the subjective, you open that door into a world with which you have very little experience. You also take a very serious chance that when this door is open, the flood of your own inner psychic stress is going to pour out into the objective life. Instead of being redeemed and at peace, you are going to be in greater confusion than you were before. This confusion, however, is not always easily rationalized. It is not something in which the actual incidents of your previous physical experiences will be revealed to you. You will not be able to find always or very often that some pressure in your psychic life can be immediately traced to a particular incident in your environment. In many cases, it becomes a kind of vague a form of reaction. This reaction most always takes the form of symbolism. And symbolism is a very difficult thing to work with. If the pressures within yourselves come out into manifestation through symbols rather than through incidents, then you have the same type of problem that is involved in dream symbolism. The individual awake can release a dream underworld from within himself. And this presenting itself in all kinds of forms and all types of symbols, emblems, figures, and devices can present a very serious problem. Now, one of the more simple but definite examples of this is the study of 
dispositional and character attitudes. The average person wants to have a sphere of influence. He wants some sense of importance. He wants to have leadership of some kind in something. He is very desirous of preparing some type of background to become a significant person. Now this is a situation that can very often become deeply involved in psychic phenomena. The individual, for example, is not content with his job. He feels that he could do something bigger and better. And most people feel this, to a measure at least. That they are restricted and limited by circumstances and that their true worth is not appreciated. This can appear in business, in family, in relationships of parents and children. But many persons have a distinct feeling that they should be doing more than they are doing in the sense of gaining a distinction of some kind. Now, uh, there are two ways of approaching this particular problem. Those who are very practical in their thinking and are not too heavily loaded psychically with pressures decide, well, there's a great future for a computerization, therefore I'm going to take a course in it. I'm going to study it. I'm going to find ways of advancing my career. Other people, however, with a little different type of mind and maybe not quite as much a true basic ambition, would like to gain this superior relationship with life without any serious effort on their own part. So they philosophize along the idea that they have a right to be anything they want to be without really earning this advancement. They want to get it in some other way. So some try to get it through prayer, others through concentration and meditation, and still others through contact with mystics and psychics who are going to be able to give them uh, some kind of a philosophy of personal superiority. We have this all the time. Most of the people who are having psychic disturbances at the present time have in some way involved themselves in the social problems of the hour and feel that they have been cu curiously and wonderfully appointed to become one of the great solving factors in human problems. That they are the ones who are going to be the future leaders of a spiritualized world. Well, we have a great many of these folks come along and I have watched their progress over probably, well, over half a century now. And I had not yet found any instance in which a psychic promise that an individual is going to have some type of illumination that is meaningful, useful, practical, serviceable. I've never yet seen a case where this was fulfilled. It continues to drift and drag. The individual very often gives up that which is reasonable and practical in a strange search for that which can never and has never uh, been earned or properly deserved. I believe in the law of cause and effect. The individual who wishes to become a powerful constructive factor in society has to cause this through the development and improvement of his own nature. It cannot be conferred upon him by some mysterious force or power which he does not even understand. He is not going to get answers that are important to questions which he does not understand. We, are, we have so many times people come and say, I have these symbolisms, I feel that they are very important, but what do they mean? It is almost impossible to answer this question for the reason that these symbols go back into the life of a person. These symbols do not descend from some level of cosmic alphabet. They come from the life of that person. They are bound directly to the background of perhaps a half century of individual living with its reverses, with its frustrations, and with its insecurities. Now we are having a very serious situation developing in the world, and that situation deals with the actual future of humanity under the pressure 
of a nuclear armament. The problem of the future of humanity is to most people very serious and uh, very disturbing. So in this particular instance, this type of thing, there is a desperate searching for some kind of assurance, some type of reality, or at least some way by which this present trend can be averted. Those who are unable to feel any particular solutional power or do not know what actually must be done have a great desire to try to understand themselves better. They want to know what happens to the human being if the worst happens in the material world. What is going to happen to a person here who suddenly is cast into another dimension of existence by nuclear warfare? Where is he going? Is he going to survive? Does he exist? What is the future of the individual who is faced with some form of physical annihilation? This question, of course, has been asked from not only from the standpoint of war, but from the standpoint of daily existence. Everyone who comes into this world is faced with the problem of leaving it. And to leave the world is a serious issue if the person is lacking in internal strength. If he is lacking in philosophic over, uh, understanding, if he is lacking in religious faith, if he is lacking in deep integrities concerning the divine plan of things, if all these are immaturely developed within himself, he is in a panic. He does not know what to do. He does not know how to face into problems. Therefore, his first thought would be to try to demonstrate survival after death. And what the nature of this survival is takes him into the field of psychic phenomena. Another person with a little different sort of background, uh, looking back over life, realizes that from lack of understanding, he has been limited all his life, that most of the plans and dreams and hopes and aspirations that were important to him were never fulfilled because of weaknesses of his own character. Under such conditions, as he grows older, he is apt to decide the importance of some form of religious communion. Young people today are not inclined to be theologically minded, but older people are consistently concerned with the future of their own existence. To have this securely indicated for them means that they must have a solid foundation in some religious or philosophical system. Actually, all of this type of thinking is founded in a certain kind of faith. The individual has to believe, and in believing has to find his security from belief, from, from the integrity of his own consciousness. Under such circumstances, he is apt to go to other people to try to find out more about these things. And there are groups all over the country and all over the world who are attempting in one way or another to create confidence that the individual has a survival factor built into his nature, that he is bound to survive, that he is going to go on to other worlds and other dimensions of life. If he believes in reincarnation, he believes that he will be re-embodied here in the due course of time, that basically he is indestructible. And if he is indestructible, then through philosophy and insight he can gain a, a great deal of confidence. Now systems that teach people to accept the power and virtue of universal law and can help the individual to realize that the power that fashioned him did not fashion him to destroy him, but rather fashioned him as part of a vast plan of unfolding life in nature. On a level of philosophy, individuals can gain a great deal of comfort. They can also gain it on the level of religion, in which it seems to millions of people 
that their future is in the keeping of a principle of divine good and that all things that happen in this world are part of a plan for the final salvation and perfection of all that lives. With these kind of inducements, the individual can gradually develop a working philosophy of life. But very often, this is complicated today by the introduction of a whole group of extraneous elements which may or may not contribute to this major purpose. There are a great many people who honestly believe, apparently, uh, that while there is a divine plan, it is possible for the individual to change that plan without actually improving himself. That there are ways, there are tricks, there's a magic, there is some kind of a strange esoteric method by which the individual can become wise without earning wisdom, can become good by a formula, can be enlightened or strengthened by some type of uh, sentimental uh, or platitudinous statement. <coughs> this actually works against the person because he goes on with these statements, he applies them to every aspect of his life, and in the end, he is in the same condition as everyone else. These things do not change the course of his actual career. The only way that the person can get out of a weakness is to become strong. And there is no way to become strong except to earn it. The individual who wishes to be better than he is must live better than he does now. And there is no possibility of some kind of a magical intercession by which he can keep his vices and perfect his virtues at the same time. He simply cannot do it. And to most people, the present trend in the psychic uh, phenomena is to use it as a substitute for integrity or to assume that by the practice of certain disciplines, the individual can outgrow his own ignorance and become vicariously wise. We have very little evidence that this has ever been accomplished. And uh, I think the average person should not bear too much upon this because it is not strong enough to support him. I know people today who not only are seeking help from various psychic sources, but some of them have four, five, or six sources at the same time. They are going to everybody whom they think can give them an answer to their problem. The answers they get are in conflict. One in one direction, one in another. The prophecies that are made by these, uh, under these circumstances are frequently not fulfilled. And the individual, having not received what he believes he was going to receive, still goes on hoping, doing the same thing again and again. This is really a detriment, a sincere desire, even though there may be certain weaknesses or mistakes in it, has much to recommend it. But a person who simply does not recognize uh, when things are not right, uh, keeps on uh, stubbornly maintaining something that will not happen. This type of thing is difficult and not good for the average person. Now all kinds of various specialties have developed in this field. Some of them go way back, thousands of years. Others are more recent in their ingenuities. But all of them seemingly have approximately the same basic elements. Man has always hoped for the miracle. He has always had believed in a kind of magic. And it is very possible to convince him that by some mysterious means he can gain mastery over other people, dominate the community in which he lives, and perhaps most of all, accumulate wealth without earning it. These are very charming and fascinating 
possibilities. But unfortunately, in most instances, they do not work out. Books are published now every day on points and with emphasis upon sheer materialism. The, uh, not long ago, in fact quite recently, there's a book been published on the legal aspects of cults and religions. And uh, this book is more or less dominated or inspired by the complications on a legal level of individuals who are disillusioned, disappointed, and exploited in religious matters. How far can government, law, or litigation be involved in cases where individuals' religious convictions have been exploited? This is a, a grave situation. But it is obvious that the matter is getting to a point where some form of secular intervention is almost inevitable. There is going to be some form of legal recourse for persons who have been exploited in the name of religion. This does not mean that any sincere belief is going to be criticized. It does not mean that the individual is going to be denied the full expression of his faith or his inalienable right to seek spiritual consolation according to his own preferences and desires. It is, however, something that has to be faced in connection with the individual who, having supported or contributed to one of these movements, is suddenly exploited beyond a reasonable degree, or that the funds raised for religious purposes up directed to personal gain. Where this condition exists, there's going to be a great increase in care and thought, and there are going to be legal changes in the statutes which will protect the individual from dishonesty in the name of religion. Now, this does not affect most of us for the reason that the average individual is not really worried about that, except in a certain cases where it should be obvious to him in the first place. But uh, what is really the problem is how the person is going to evaluate his own inner experience with religion. How is he going to evaluate what has happened to himself on a religious level? Well, the only answer to this is to settle down quietly and do some serious thinking. And in most cases, people in trouble in this field will not do this. They are not willing to sit down, sit down and see their own mistakes. They are not willing to admit that they have been hoodwinked or that they have deceived themselves. They want to keep on pressing the points which they themselves have become accustomed to. I think probably that most of you have heard or read about a mirage in the desert. Uh, this is a phenomenon that is known throughout the world and in some cases is very highly specialized. The most common form of it is that in the desert an individual will look over towards the horizon and he will see, for instance, a beautiful grove of trees or an oasis or perhaps even a stream or a lake against the sky. As he approaches it, it fades away and, and there is nothing there but the desert itself. Now, a considerable amount of man's wishful thinking is like a mirage. It seems to be something very beautiful lying ahead or out somewhere in the desert of wilderness of waiting and frustration. But as he approaches it, it fades away because it is an illusion and a delusion. Now, each person must evaluate his own beliefs, his own religious convictions, to find out if there are among them some delusions or illusions. Otherwise, he will be constantly seeking that which has no existence or is not available to him under any condition. So we have the person who is waiting patiently for enlightenment. He is waiting day by day for illumination. He is waiting to have some strange and mysterious being or power take over his life and bring him to perfection. This waiting goes on and on. It does not happen 
because actually the individual has not thought it through. He has not answered a very simple question. When people ask me, and some of them I do, how it happens that they were so fortunate as to have an illumination, uh, that at least what they thought was an illumination, and that have come under the special uh, control or protection of divine beings, I have often asked them, how did you happen to deserve this? What did you do to earn it? Why were you picked out of a million people to receive the deeper and inner instruction? And I've never had an answer that made sense. Most of them admitted they had no idea. That they, had, they couldn't, didn't understand it themselves. They didn't know why they'd been chosen out of millions of people. So the next question is, for those people who think it has happened to them, to uh, measure themselves and see what they might have inside that would have justified it. What had they done? What kind of lives had they lived? Did they rise above the commonplace in conduct? Were they especially honest? Were they dedicated? Were they good parents? Were they faithful uh, marriage partners? Would they always do the thing as nobly and honorably as possible? Uh, were they satisfied with a quiet life and moderate existence? What had they done that out of many they should be chosen? And they didn't know. And after looking them over carefully, it became evident that there was nothing visible to indicate their selection. They had no abilities. They had no understanding that was av available to them. And sometimes these people went through a whole series of relationships with, psychi with psychism or some metaphysical group, and they ended up where they started from because they were not taught anything that was practical to do even when they were under instruction. It was simply a case of a wishful thinking of a great desire which was not backed by anything. So wherever you start thinking about meditation or concentration or Zen or some discipline to unfold inner consciousness, the question must always be considered as to how qualified the person is to receive such enlightenment. How is he going to use it? How is he going to get away from his own futility simply by practicing a discipline of some kind, which does not contain within it any particular solution? The, uh, a good example of this, of course, is the classical case of a, a young American who wanted to be a Zen monk. He went to the Orient, he studied there, and he sat very quietly in the corner and was ignored year after year. He was not uh, picked up as a wonderful prime candidate and given all kinds of attention. And he remained quietly in the shadow of the temple for ten years before one of the masters of the temple came and began to give him a little instruction. He had to prove himself. He had to prove that nothing could turn him away. He had to prove that there were no personal ambitions in himself. He had to prove that he was not out to be rich or powerful or dominate other people. He had to simply dedicate himself in a simple, direct way to whatever the rules were of the, of the group to which he belonged. He wisely chose a group that had had a wonderful background and was highly respected and revered for nearly a thousand years. He was therefore reasonably certain that he was on the right track. All this type of thing finally sums our up, I think, into the problems of the person's life. The beginning of life, the, in the lesser mysteries, as they were called in Greece and Egypt and India, the lesser mysteries are right here. The beginning of esotericism is in your home, your shop, and your business, and your relation with your children and friends. The beginning of philosophy is the daily use of common sense. Those who ex ex uh, hope or aspire to enlightenment 
are the ones who live within their means, who undo do not uh, cultivate debt, who refrain from unnecessary extravagances, and do not fall under those luxury pressures which contribute to moral or physical dishonesty. The individual begins here by putting his life in order. He also takes advantage, as far as possible, of the opportunities here for anything that he wishes to do. The uh, ancients, when they brought some candidate to the temple, always required that this candidate bring with him an offering worthy of the temple. This was not an offering of money, because in ancient times, most of the religious systems were subsidized by the state. What he was expected to bring was an ability. He was expected to have a proficiency that was useful. A proficiency which assisted him to be a better servant of human need. Something that would help others. Something that he could use because he was trained in it. And would therefore have a proper ability to use it wisely. Perhaps he was trained in medicine. He had taken a course in that in the temples of the God of Healing. After he had graduated from that, he dedicated his medical knowledge to the service of humanity. And it was not until medicine was secularized that there was any known corruption in the medical world. Another might take law, become a leader of governments. One might become an instructor of children. Still another might become an artist or a musician or perhaps intentionally and purposefully become an agriculturist and raise food for others to eat. He must have some dedication to the service of humanity, a dedication which was not only willingness but skill. He must be able to do this type of thing. If he was to become a teacher, he must have had the background for it. It was only the ability that he possessed that he could dedicate to God. His ignorance was of no value to himself or the universe. His wisdom was valuable to all who needed it. So the problem was to start here. Curb appetites, normalize life, rationalize experiences, live in a natural, healthful manner. Take care of the small daily problems as they arise. For if we are faithful unto small things, we shall be made master over greater things. But to avoid the small and rush desperately after the greater is to fail completely. Having they gained this external knowledge of life, having proven conclusively the ability to be a conscientious householder, which means, for the most part, that the individual was able to withstand all material temptations that might lure him away from the development of his own integrities. When he had this achieved achievement and had brought his gift to the temple, then a career was directed for him. He was given the means to do those things which he was trained to do, because to the religious mind, there is no such a thing as secular learning. It makes no difference whether you're a carpenter or a priest. All is sacred. All usefulness is sacred. All uselessness is profane. Having therefore decided the area of service, the area of dedication, the individual becomes inwardly inspired to do the things which he has prepared himself to do. He started out with a determination to be prepare for a job worth living for. And this job unfolds with him. He doesn't have to have a very special attention bestowed by someone else. He doesn't have to take an aptitude test. He knows in his own heart, if he's dedicated, why he learned and what he intended to do with learning. And he uses it. And gradually, as a result of this, his inner life opens up. His inner life opens up because he has no pressures. He has no pressures because he has no egotism left in himself. He has no worldly ambitions. 
He is not trying uh, to be go- uh, godly on one hand and a millionaire on the other. He is t- simply, quietly, knowing his own limitations, knowing his own abilities, knowing his own purposes in life, and gradually gains a reputation, he gains a certain amount of influence because he is skilled and because he is able. As this continues along, then the quest of the over self begins to be more meaningful. The individual, in order to have the courage and wisdom, must call more and more upon his own resources. As he advances in his skills, as he advances in his profession, his temptations increase correspondingly. He requires much greater self-discipline as he goes further and higher in his career. For there the temptations will be pressing. There will be many opportunities uh, to compromise principles. The person with few abilities has few opportunities and few temptations. But as he goes further along, he demands and depends upon greater insights. Also, as he advances in any science or any art or any profession or trade, he gradually comes to the point where he wants to know more about the thing that he has already chosen. He can have graduated cum laude from the greatest university in the world, but he still will not understand history. He may have gone through philosophy for years, but he still will not understand all of philosophy. Before understanding is perfected, the inner life of the individual has to be given control of all faculties and powers. He must gradually learn the real mystery beyond and behind all material things. He will have to find gradually a consecration in which what might otherwise be a secular subject suddenly becomes sacred and the person becomes completely dedicated uh, to the perfection of his attained art or science. As this goes on, all knowledge becomes a key to the ultimate knowledge, the ultimate knowledge of the divine plan itself. And by degrees, knowledge brings with it certitude. For ultimately, through skill, the individual develops the realization of the absolute workings of universal law. So as he goes on, it becomes then probably very important for him uh, to have more and more communion with the source of life within himself. On the other hand, this communion is also a temptation. The individual who is interested in a religious life is very often disillusioned in secular living. He feels that the world around him is simply an impediment, that he becomes more and more aware that he has difficulty adjusting uh, to worldly conditions. They hurt him. They uh, irritate and aggravate him. And he wishes constantly that he could do the things that would change all this. But he can't accomplish all that, nor should he be disturbed by the fact that the world is the way it is. He may do all he can to help it, but he cannot wisely condemn it for its own shortcomings. The world continues to be itself, and the wise and dedicated person must live in it must conquer its pressures in himself and must dedicate his own life to the service of whatever reforms or reformations of character he is able to accomplish. Under such conditions, he may want occasionally uh, to have periods of meditation or quietude or rest or opportunity to organize his resources against the confusions of his time. But he will never take the attitude that he is going to substitute his own hope for personal growth for his duty to society. The individual who retires from humanity to take care of his own spirituality is on the rim of a serious disaster. 
We are not here primarily to advance our own cause by the neglect of our social responsibilities. We are here uh, to forget ourselves very largely in the common service of those whose need is greater than our own. Therefore, the individual who chooses to retire from humanity uh, in order to protect his own spirituality should give the matter another thought. He is on the wrong track. He is not to be concerned primarily with his own growth. His own growth is a byproduct. The only way the individual can grow spiritually is to forget himself in the service of those whose need is greater than his own. He cannot directly make himself spiritual, but he can, through forgetting himself in service, attain spirituality. But he will never find it by demanding it, requiring it, or envisioning it for himself primarily. We are not here is, as human beings to think only of ourselves. We are here to forget ourselves. And in the beginning of our spiritual growth, the less we think about ourselves, the more we will unfold the natural resources with which we are endowed. Thus, when we come face to face with literature in these fields, where we find offer after offer telling us how we can become spiritual, how we can become rich, how we can gain influence over others. These statements in themselves should tell that we're on the wrong track, because no individual has ever found his way to heaven by taking care of himself. He has found it by dedicating his life to the service of that power which alone can command. And that power is the power to serve those around him. And from small services, he can increase to greater services. But always his mind is upon one thing, the greater good to the greater number. Otherwise, he is going to fall into some form of psychic malpractice very, very quickly. Having finally come to the conclusion uh, that most of his efforts have been comparatively wasted, it is necessary for him to also give a certain amount of discriminational thinking uh, to any group of people with whom he wishes to have an intimate association. If he wants to join some movement, he has a perfect right to do so. But for his own good, he must estimate as far as he possibly can the integrities of any groups with which he may become involved or desire to be. He should be very careful not to permit himself to be lured into some association on the basis that it is going to advance his own personal interest. It is not fair and not right for the person to develop extrasensory perceptions in order that he may deceive his neighbors. Nor should he gain a clairvoyant ability so he can find out how to foreclose a mortgage on the widows and the fatherless. These things are, ma are black magic in every sense of the word. The use of spiritual power to defraud or to debase or to injure or to damage anyone else is something that no sincere person would contemplate even for a moment. And yet, without realizing it, we can be lured into these things by very elaborate propaganda, by all kinds of promises, and in some cases, a few threats. But uh, avoid all of this type of thing. Otherwise, you will be in trouble all the time. Now, there are a great many people who are going to do wonderful things in this world, without the development of extrasensory faculties. The possibility of having growth without some form of psychic experience is very real and very important. Some persons will have extrasensory perceptions and some have almost uh, been born with a potential to this. Under such conditions, their problem is to control and direct these faculties, to serve them, uh, to serve the public good, to serve others in need, to advance religious purposes and causes, 
or to add to the security of those around them. But it is not necessary to have this type of experience. Some of the greatest saints and mystics of all times have never had visions. They have never had any metaphysical experience. They have had a simple religious dedication. They have simply built their lives around the New Testament, or the Old Testament, or the Sermon on the Mount. They have gone along day by day, serving gently and quietly in the cause of principles. These people have had a constant unfoldment, which is not necessarily accompanied by miraculous happenings. They have gained insights, they have become wiser and wiser, but they have not seen things or had symbols that they couldn't understand. They have rather simply grown up in wisdom and in charity and faced the future with a good hope. Now the symbol problem gets to be very complicated. And in the course of time we get symbolic documents almost without end. These symbols people see, they think they believe them, they have a feeling that those things have happened. Whether they are visions or dreams or extrasensory experiences, they do not know, but they expect someone else to describe, interpret, and explain these symbols. Actually, in most cases, there is no way in which this is possible. The nearest possible way would be to go into analytical psychology and uh, have these symbols explained in terms of a Jungian analysis or something of that nature. But this is a long and difficult problem and requires a great deal of time and thought and effort and today considerable expense. These symbols are personal. They mean something to the person who receives them. And these symbols are their own psychic pressures geometrized. They are pictures of their own pressures and their own attitudes. You remember, of course, Aesop's fables. Well, the fables were symbols of human behavior. Fontaine's fables the same way. The emblem writers and symbolists of the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe dramatized attitudes by means of pictures. They created symbols to represent the attitudes, the virtues, the vices, the practices, the beliefs, the opinions, and the fallacies of human nature. Every symbol, therefore, that is experienced in a dreamlike relationship with life is some expression of the pressure in ourselves. These, pre these pressures do not come back always as literal Re recapitulations of things that happened. They come back as diagrams. They come back as symbolic figures telling something about happenings within ourselves. Some of these figures could be musical notes. Sound can carry the message. Words can carry it. Thoughts, scenes, landscapes, persons, animals. Geometrical figures, stars, auras, magnetic fields, all these things uh, come through into consciousness, usually in a semi-dream state. They come through sometimes because the individual has conditioned themselves to get them. In other words, they may come through in concentration, in meditation, and in various forms of self-discipline. The danger of these things is that they are not understood. And the individual, having experiences of this kind, which he cannot interpret himself, then turns to someone else to have it explained for him. No one else can explain it. It is something that is intimately associated with one individual. It is a principle, a truth, an idea, an attitude, or a negative pattern which is unique to that person, and that person will have to try and explain it. If the symbols are morbid, if the situation is negative, then it means that the psychic pressure is very, very heavy. Sometimes these symbols are simply 
mathematical figures of the attitude the person is now trying to take. For instance, if he is in contemplation, he is in meditation, if he's idealistically searching for something, the very mood itself which is moving him becomes symbolized. It may be that he is hoping that some good thing will happen, dedicated and very serious, so he sees light. He sees luminous things, which are the evidences of his own effort to become enlightened. It, the symbol may be only his own attitude at the moment, pictured mathematically or diagrammatically. Or it may be an accumulation of pressures within himself. But whatever it is, it means what it means to him. And the constant effort to have it explained is more or less useless. However, he will get all kinds of explanations if he approaches different people. Each may try to tell him what they think it means. But when they tell him what they think it means, what they are really telling is what it would mean to them if it had occurred to them. In other words, the symbol would be interpreted in terms of the person who is interpreting it not in the person, to the person to whom it first appeared. Therefore, in religious symbolism, much of it is derived from scripture. Much of it is taken from religious and philosophical art and sources. But always the symbolism is determined by what it means to the person who sees it at that moment or under those conditions. And uh, one thing you can say, if these symbols are attractive and beautiful, and pleasant, then the individual has achieved a certain harmony within himself. But he even has to be careful of this, because the primary purpose of all of this discipline is not simply physical or mental pleasure. It has to have to do with great and deep realities. And it must go deeper than satisfying the mind or the emotions. It must be a true expression of the internal life of the individual. So we go through all of these problems and we find everywhere today a tremendous increase of pressureful symbolism. We find every day practically some new prediction appears in the press, some new threat usually. Most predictions today are negative largely because the person doing the predicting feels negative themselves. If the person is afraid and he has a mystical experience or thinks it's that, it may be simply a fear experience. If the person is frustrated, it may be a frustrate experience. If it involves society, it may be revengeful or it may be an effort to stand against the prevailing policy. But in every instance that we know of in recent times, the trend has been to represent the whole subtle subconscious of the human race as under tremendous anxiety, under great stress and fear. Therefore, a prophecy uh, of doom an effort to, to date a disaster is very often wishful thinking. And time and time again, the disaster does not occur as dated, because the dating ties into something within the consciousness of the person and has been expanded to cover all society. Actually, the answer lies in the gradual correction of these ills by which the individual is personally uh, under pressure and stress. Actually, however, if you think for a moment, you will realize that about the only way in which the present condition can be finally solved is for it to become unendurable. As long as there is an opportunity for the individual to do as he pleases, when he doesn't please to do the right thing, and get away with it, there will be no change in the social pattern. We will only have correction when it becomes obvious that there is no other answer. 
we will continue to exploit each other, we will continue to dramatize our own attitudes and um, commercialize our own theologies as long as this is possible, as long as it is within our capacity to endure the consequences of our own misdeeds. Therefore, the quicker things come to a head, the better off we will all be. I remember a man who I talked to back in 29 when we had the big crash in the stock market. He lost everything he had one day. He was wiped out completely. He had been margining, as so many had, and it caught him, and he was through. A few hours before, he'd been a wealthy man. Now he was a bankrupt. I talked with him, and he said, What did you do when you found out you just lost everything you had? Well, he said, You'd be surprised what I did. I went home and went to bed, and I slept for the first time in six months. <laughs> Now, society is going to be faced with this kind of situation. It is only when something happens and we no longer can escape the consequences of our own mistakes that we can go home and have a good night's sleep. It's only possible to solve these problems uh, by changing our own ways of life. And it's the same with the person who has a bad home life, who has uh, children that are wayward, and consequently is loaded with psychic pressures and extroverts them through strange dreams and symbols. We're going to have these prophecies of dire circumstances until we stop setting up dire circumstances. We're going to fear for what we have as long as we are so tied to possession that the loss of it becomes the major tragedy in life. When society does make its major moves, as it must someday, it does not mean that people will all be wiped out. It means actually that people will begin to value what is truly valuable and will be able to sleep well. The Chinese had a saying that in the primary, primary time of things, when there were only sages upon the earth, the sages all slept without dreams. And this is, to a certain degree, our problem. It is the pressure in ourselves that is not lo only luring us into difficulties, but also luring us into finding false panaceas, trying to find ways to get out of our troubles without changing ourselves. And there are always a certain number of persons willing to exploit this need. But when it's all said and done, uh, they may make a quick profit, but the person who is uh, over-influenced by them is still in the same difficulties. So I think it's very important in, in connection with all types of this uh, kind of situation for the person to remain rather quiet and make certain rules and plans which he can follow. If you are interested in an organization of some nature or a group, do not allow yourself to be lured in on the ground of what it's going to do for you. Rather take the attitude that if you become associated with that organization, that you can do something constructive for them. Do not join to get, join to give. In a philosophy of life, do not center yourself upon a teaching of how you can be superior to other people. I'll rather take the attitude of trying to gain a knowledge which will enable you to help other people to be superior to what they are now. If you are interested in health, or if you're interested in the harmony of home life and so on, learn or understand the principles behind these things. If you expect a more happy home, do the things to make it. Do not depend upon some trick. If you happen to have relatives that belong to different religions, this sometimes is a terrible situation. It can be very difficult, but the only answer to it for each person involved is to realize that we all have the right to follow the ideals that are closest to us. We have a right to have the religions in which we were born if we want them. 
No one should accuse us of being better or worse because of a religion. We should all do what the American Indian did, observe the person, and if his conduct was good, his religion is right. Don't go any further. Never question the right of individuals to his faith, but look for those who live what they believe. They are the sincere ones. You are inclined, maybe, to the same problem. You may be trying to save somebody from the error of his religions. Don't do it. Help him to understand his own, and hope that he will help you to understand your own. But if you do help him to understand his, you're liable to find out a lot about your own. All these things work right back to practical common sense and not to some strange beliefs. And do not fall back into the witchcraft of the Middle Ages. Do not try to change people in spite of themselves or without their knowledge. Do not follow all of these strange systems that are now gaining vogue and some of which are already in tragic difficulties. Be very slow to affiliate unless you are able to examine carefully, study thoroughly, and understand fully what is involved. A very important thing is to find out the source of beliefs. If you have a belief that is interesting to you, and it depends upon a revelation of some kind, it is your right and privilege to thoroughly understand that revelation. You have a right to know where any teaching originated. And if an organization refuses to tell you, then be careful. And if it comes from some source that nobody can explore, be still more careful. Because there's under those conditions, there is nothing that you can depend on except the validity of the revelation itself. And if this revelation is unselfish, helps you to grow to be a better person, promises you nothing but hard work and very little opportunity uh, to get into trouble. If it is a dedication to the public good, you can give it another thought. But if it's something that is supposed to make you better than somebody else who hasn't got the entitlement to this revelation, be very careful. Because we cannot, uh, we cannot hope to allow faith to create a delusion or support one. We have no need to believe what is incomprehensible to us. We have no right to believe without question that which is concealed from us by other people. And in doubt, stay yourself, be yourself. Try to grow according to your own light. Serve, study for yourself, Base your philosophy upon those teachings that have stood the test of ages. Recognize that in this universe, we are going to be here for a while, then we're not going to be here, and then we may be here again. If there's any part of the invisible world that we ought to know about, we'll be there to see it one of these days. And we'll also come back with a better insight as to what to do. Do not permit other people to over-influence you away from a natural, normal, Christian understanding of life, a simple, honorable integrity. Anything that takes you away from this is liable to get into trouble. So don't also ask other people to interpret your symbols. If these symbols are valid, there are excellent texts available on them. The symbol always is a mandala. It is always a meditation figure. If a symbol is presented to you under mystical conditions of some nature, it is your privilege to find in yourself the key to that symbol. It is given you for your own growth. And when you try to get everyone else to tell you what it means, you will not find out what it actually means because its meaning to you is very personal. And one of the ways in which ancient instruction was given was by means of impressing symbols upon consciousness. Symbols that tell you all the things you need to know. 
if you will quietly accept them. But when you get a symbol that is interesting, uh, don't feel that it is something very, very wonderful and cosmically meaningful. Say, what does it mean to me now, here, and with the problems I now face? Is it a symbol of hope? Is it a symbol of faith? Is it a symbol of charity? Is it a symbol of discipline? All of these things you have to consider. Many symbols, especially light symbols, are encouragements, telling you that something is being accomplished. Something is being changed for the better within yourself. But do not, under any conditions, get all upset over the symbol and figure that perhaps you are on the very verge of cosmic consciousness. Take the symbol for what it is, try to understand it, and as you unfold your own simple contemplation of it, other symbols will probably come along to help you to understand its full meaning. Be very moderate in your aspirations, be gentle and kind, and try to use the faculties of the inner life for the good of your community and your world. Also, never permit your interest in the greater things to cause you to overlook the simple daily responsibilities of life. Somewhere for each of us the self must die, and until the self must, can die, the divine cannot be clearly manifested through our natures. We are not going to be ourselves as persons with divine powers. We are going to gradually relax those divine powers into our natures. We will cease to be aggressive persons. We will be pens in the hand of a ready writer. We will be the instruments of a divine purpose, and our end is not our fulfillment of our own purposes, but our gradual acceptance and living of the divine purpose for all living things. In those days, there will be great changes in this world, but they will all be good changes. In the meantime, do not allow yourself to use religion to gratify selfishness, gratify personal ambitions, or gratify a sensational desire for some kind of a mystery. Use what you understand and what you believe for the good of all concerned. Be very quiet, be very gentle, and be slow to assume anything that you do not understand. Take it easy, and in the course of time, you will be rewarded. You will be rewarded, but remember the words of St. Paul. Try the spirits. Test them. When anything is done along mystical lines that is supposed to have certain outcomes, see whether it does or not. See if promises are fulfilled. See if what you were told would happen will happen. If it doesn't happen, then you have a perfect right to withdraw your confidence. Always test the spirits, test the messages, and where you find they are inaccurate or do not fulfill themselves, recognize this immediately and gathering yourself up depart from that particular illusion. Try to keep the mind practical, honest, straight and do not allow mysticism to confuse you. It should not confuse, it should clarify. It should help you to have the faith in things unseen, but it does not justify your accepting exploitation or mysteries that are incomprehensible to you. Faith is basically the belief that there is a devouring power in life. That which we earn will come to us, that which we deserve will be ours, and that which we build for we will attain if we have built correctly and the goal is right. In this simple way, study, learn, work, and have all the happiness of realizing the importance of a constructive dedication. With this kind of thinking, you can't get into very much trouble. Well, I guess that's it.